Okay, I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online, and we are going to be looking in just a moment at Revelation uh, chapter 2, verses 8 through 17. Uh, we've got some special guests with us today that we want to introduce, and Ronnie's got some prayer requests. So let's do our guests first, and those of you watching online, we'll make this as quick as possible, and we'll jump right in uh, to our study. Uh, but uh, Andy Heyman, Colonel Heyman, where did you run off to? There he is back here. <laughs> Commander here uh, at Vance Air Force Base, then became the defense attache uh, for Africa uh, in Morocco. We visited them in Rabat, had a great time. Just finished in Paris and retired after how many years, Andy? 31 years with the United States Air Force. And uh, yeah, thank you for your service. Yeah, Bill, we've got some chairs up here uh, as well, uh, if you don't mind sitting on those cushiony green ones. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Um, other guests, Ronnie, who else? Gene Cummings. Gene, Gene's a friend. Gene's been a huge uh, supporter of me, uh, of Astoria Cherry, the same way. Gene, good to see you. Praying for Cherry. Um, a sweet, sweet lady. Just put her at Golden Oaks. Has struggled with some physical uh, issues, and, and Gene has cared for her over the years. So, Gene, thank you for being here today. First time he could come because he's not caring for his wife. Anybody else, Roddy? That's it? All right, I'll turn it to you for prayer requests. Well, we've got uh, Josh Armstrong back with us this week. Ah, oh, Josh, good to have you back, Josh. Yeah, we didn't run you off last week. I guess not. So, Okay, all yours, Ronnie. All right, uh, gentlemen, and for those that are online uh, watching, uh, we're doing our prayer requests different. When we're not going to speak them out, uh, I might pray over our group that we got on our on our list. But if you don't have an email with us on file, let us know so that we can get those sent to you. The more praying, I mean, we all believe in it. And uh, so, and I want to say, uh, this is the largest group we've had. Yeah. This is uh, 50 now with Matt Price walking in on us. Uh, we, we got 50. But on, uh, on the tables and then at the back of the room, there's pads. And just write your prayer requests down on those. I'll gather them up at the end of the uh, our meeting uh, uh, over Revelation. And then I will get those typed up and then I will get those sent to Wade, which then he adds a little bit and then sends them out. There's still a few books out at the back that were brought in by someone. The... Uh, our Daily Bread, a good devotional book, plus a good way to be able to read the Bible through in a year's time. So I encourage you, if you don't get it at your local church, that you, you gather it up. It would be really great and helpful. So at this time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear gracious loving Father, Lord, we're thankful, Father, that as a group of men that we can gather this morning. Father, we can gather in, in a country, Lord, where we don't have uh, governments that discourage, restrict, where we can not worship you, Father. We're thankful, Father, that we can come together as this group of men. Yes. Pray for everyone that comes through the door, Lord. I pray for those who are watching online, that, Lord, our hearts would be open, our eyes, our mouths, our ears, that we would be able to hear what you have in store for each and every one of us, Father. Yes. Father, we also have a, a group that we place on our prayer list. You know each and every one of them, Father. You know what their needs are. You know what their afflictions are, Father. We just pray that your hand would be upon them, Father, and that they would feel your presence. So this morning, Father, open up our hearts as we go into your book. And Father, we just pray that you would reveal to us what you want us to learn from it. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ronnie. All righty. Is it hot? <laughs> Me, it was. Was it really? Well, let's see what we can do. Okay, let's open up, and we're going to begin reading in Revelation 
chapter 2 and verse 8, and uh, Doc was with me uh, Tuesday when we had um, our women's study, and we had the same issue, Doc, uh, with uh, our monitor. We've got some great pictures today. Not sure what's going on here, but uh, we're going to try to figure this out, and uh, uh, we'll get these up here in, in just a moment. But, uh, Tim, I'm going to ask you to do us a favor. Um, you've got a good voice, and I'm going to ask you to read Revelation 2, 8 through 17. And if you'll just read it clearly, we'll come back and discuss it all after you read it. Make sense? So, 8 through 17. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, the words of the first uh, and the last who died and who came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested for ten days, you will, be, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto <coughs> death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, to let he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. <coughs> I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast to my name, and you, and you did not deny my faith. You did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, <coughs> who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear to the ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Okay. Let me Let ask me you a few questions as we begin. In reading that text, what are a couple of things that stand out to you in terms of questions that you have about the text itself? Anybody? What strikes you about this? What's the translation of that many churches? Say, say that again. No, no, no. What's the translation of Satan? What's the word? That, very good. Very good. What is the word for Satan? Uh, and it is satana in Greek. So it's literally Satan. Yeah. yeah, it's Satan. You also have the word devil, which is diabolos in Greek. Doc, give us the definition for diabolos in Greek. Hmm. Well, I think literally it means throwing against, and it probably means accuser. Something like that. Yep. By the way, it comes from the root word to throw, and you'll notice um, in this text, some are thrown into prison by Diabolus or the devil. I think it's a play on words here. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me throw some things out. If we can get the pictures up, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> These seven churches are in what the Bible calls Asia Minor. Today, we call it Turkey. This is the second of the seven churches. It's called Smyrna. It's the only city in Turkey today that is still 
extant or still in existence, but its name has changed to Izmir. And John, I think you've probably been to Izmir. Yeah, it's a beautiful city on the coast. Here's what's interesting about... But when you go in the cemetery, they, they take you to Smyrna, not Izmir. Correct. Smyrna's inland about a mile. They have ruins there. Izmir is on the coast, but that's where Smyrna was back in the day. Now, here's what's interesting about Smyrna. Beginning in verse 8, going through verse 11. It's the only one of the seven churches where tribulation and poverty are mentioned. But yet, if you read there in verse 8, God says of the Christians in Smyrna, yet... In spite of your tribulation and poverty, you are rich. What we're going to talk about here in terms of Smyrna is the synagogue of Satan, their tribulation, the Christians, and what this means. Now, let me pause here for just a moment and ask you a question. When you hear the term synagogue of Satan, what do you think? What do you think that is? Anti-Semitism. Huh? Anti-Semitism. You know, by the way, Doc did a pretty good job in his book on synagogue of Satan. Uh, Ryan says, It's people who are opposed to God. What does it say in your text in terms of qualifying synagogue of Satan? Who are they? The Jews who are not. They are Jews in name only, but they are not truly Jews. Is that the Jews who don't believe in Christ? It's a great question. What? That's been kind of weird because he's sending it to the church, and so I think they're referring to the Jews in the church. Am I correct? Um, that's a great question. Um, some say you would be correct. These are Jews in the Christian church. That don't believe in Christ that are synagogue of Satan, or am I wrong? I could be totally wrong. No, that's all right. Some people say that. Tim, I do not believe these Jews are in the church of Jesus Christ at yeah. Smyrna. Neither does Doc, neither do you, Tim. I think the synagogue that's there in the city is a synagogue of Satan. Remember, they're, they're still Jews. These right. people that are Christians, a lot of them are still Jews, and they've been shut out of the synagogue. Right. Which also means that they're shut out of a lot of economic advantages yep. that come with being a member of the synagogue. Yep. So that's part of why they have poverty, is yep. because they're not able to yep. buy and trade and sell yep. the way normal people do. Yeah. All right, let me give you some <laughs> personal application. application. Where do Jews worship? What do they call it? Synagogue. Synagogue. Is there a synagogue in Enid? Yes. Really? Yeah. Where? Off of Willow, off of Willow, off of Willow. I did not know yeah. that. No. There is. I did not know that. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Now, that, that's, that's a messianic Jewish church, so it wouldn't typically be a true synagogue. The closest I know of is in Oklahoma City, uh, right off of, uh, of uh, Broadway Extension, um, around, uh, it's about two blocks from where my son lives. But let me show you something. Anybody know when synagogues began for the Jews? Great, great guess. Doc, what do you think? I don't know. You don't know? Okay, well, since I know everything, I'll tell you when it started. No, you know what he does? When, yeah. when someone asks him a hard question, he doesn't know the answer. He says, that's a good question. I just have to think for a second. I'll tell you my opinion. I believe synagogues began after the destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar in 586. And here's why. 
you no longer have temple worship. The Jews are in exile in Babylon. And so they start building centers of assembly where they can gather together, face Jerusalem, and do three things. The Jews, in Hebrew, call it a house of prayer, a house of assembly, a house of study. <coughs> Synagogues began to proliferate around the world after 586 B.C. Now, John, I think you're probably uh, pretty accurate. They became very popular first century B.C., but I think they began after the destruction of the temple. Now, Tim is right, in my opinion. There is a synagogue of Jews in Smyrna. But these are Jews, Ryan, whose heart has not been circumcised. They are Jews outwardly, but not inwardly. So, let's be careful here. What I'm about to tell you is not anti-Semitism. I think those of you who know me know I'm very pro-Israel. We'll talk about Israel before we go. Okay, but Doc does a good job in his book. We've got to talk about the Jews for just a moment. The writer of Revelation is calling the synagogue where the Jews meet in Smyrna a synagogue of Satan. Well, You agree? Yes. He does agree. Good night. <laughs> We're in agreement. Well, when I, when I decided to go into ministry, I felt God had called me. My Jewish neighbor threw a, a party for me. Yes. Had a big dinner, and he, and he stood up and he said, Son, you're making a terrible mistake. Your dad has this business. You should take it over. We're right next door to it. And there's no such thing as God or hell, all those things the church is preaching. No. And I said, Well, Mr. Schmitter, I see you every Friday afternoon at 6 o'clock. You shut down and you go to the synagogue and then you're there all day on Saturday. And we were close. To I knew what he was doing. He said, oh, son, there's more than one reason to go to the synagogue. That's where I make all my contracts. Hmm. Business decisions. And, and I think there are a lot of Jews like that. They're atheists. Hmm. If you want to find hard-nosed atheists, go to Israel. Because of the Holocaust, because of all the problems, they've just given up on God. And I think a synagogue with folks like that is a synagogue of Satan. Yeah. By the way, Billy Graham got in trouble in 1973. He was in Richard Nixon's office and he referred to the Jews as a synagogue of Satan. <laughs> and it was part of the tape that was deleted. In 1990-something, they found that portion. And Billy Graham had to make mea culpa public apologies to the Jews for using this phrase. By the way, synagogue of Satan has been used throughout history to describe people who are anti-Christ in their views of Jesus. Pope Pius IX, in 1873, wrote what's called an encyclical. It's a letter that goes to all of the Roman Catholic churches in the world, an encyclical. And he says, Freemasonry is a synagogue of Satan. Mm. So we've got Freemasons, you know, we've got Jews, two Quaker ladies in 1673 said Cambridge was a synagogue of Satan, Antichrist. They were both flogged for saying that. Cambridge was Anglican. By the way, somebody just two weeks ago called Astoria a synagogue of Satan. <laughs> Here's my point. you got to be careful that you don't call anybody you disagree with a member of the synagogue of Satan. Does that make sense? That's all I'm cautioning. Howard. Paul writes about that in Romans, Romans 2. Very, very, very good. Says, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, 
that he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Very good. So you've got Jews in the synagogue of Satan in Smyrna, and they are persecuting God's people. So I want to ask, when is the tribulation? I've heard all my life, but there's a great tribulation coming. Way out yonder in the future. But here at Smyrna, they're in tribulation. Yes. I think if you want to be honest about the Bible, <clears throat> everybody has tribulation. Hmm. It comes all the time. You know, um, what does this what does this mean to you in terms of like <coughs> The tribulation. How many of you were raised believing that revelation was about a future tribulation that was coming that has not yet happened? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm shocked. Really? How many of you were there? Raise your hand. <laughs> oh my word. Okay, well, may, maybe my struggle is because I, I read, I read ancient writers. That thought didn't exist before about the 20th century. Now, hang on. Let me be clear here. I'm not talking about historic premillennialism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the tribulation. That's all I'm talking about. Doc, why can Revelation not be about the tribulation that's to come based upon the text that we just read? Well, <clears throat> it says everything's coming soon. Yep. It's not about way out in the future. It's about what's happening now Yep. in these churches in Asia. And I think the same thing is happening to us today. I, Doc said it in his book. These Christians at Smyrna are in the tribulation. Yeah. They're being persecuted. Jews are turning them into the government because they're traitors to Rome. Well, if that's the case, that's been going on ever since. This okay. Is one reason why it's called the, the synagogue of Satan. They are being accused of being seditious to the government. Correct. Being accused of things. Correct. Our government That's, it today. Oh, okay. Ronnie's picking it up right here. Okay, we're going to jump from Smyrna to Pergamon, which is the third church. And let me show you something. I, I don't have it on the map, and you know, in the providence of God, uh, you know, we just we trust Him for this. Tim, you going to say something? Let me just say that, that this. That I believe that the ten days that's in here. Mm -hmm. It's not a literal 10 days, but it's given to them at 10 days to recall Daniel and his friends who would not eat certain foods yes. offered to them. I love that. Because, and that happened for 10 days. It was 10 days that they were tested with that, and they wouldn't give in to it. There's lots of references here to eating food uh, 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 that has been offered to idols. If you remember Balak and Balaam, uh, Balaam uh, was the prophet. Balak was the king who tried to hire Balaam to <coughs> curse Israel and he couldn't do it. His donkey had to talk to him in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. And then what did they do? Instead of doing uh, cursing them straight on, they had this feast and had them come where they fed them food that had been that had been offered to idol. Good. I mean, there's a de definite connection to that. And so what Smyrna said, the same kind of thing is going to happen to you. Not because the exact thing has happened, but it's a, the same issue as what Daniel faced way back there. Good. So the connection with the 10 days, it's not like I'm going to throw you in and it's exactly going to be 10 days and then you're going to be let out. It's to recall them or throw them back to the Daniel thing. Good, Tim. Good. We got it up. Thank you, Lord. Let me show, Let me show you something. You. The seven churches... For those of you watching on the screen, we began with Ephesus, then we go to Smyrna, then we go to Pergamum, 
Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Notice the order. Notice the order. It, he doesn't jump around like this. He goes in order. In the book of Ezekiel, chapters 25 through 29, you have prophecies of judgment from Yahweh on the nations around Israel. Moab, Ammon, and they go in the exact same order. I think, Doc, I think John is imitating Ezekiel uh, and so on. Bit. Tim, I think you're right about the ten days. Here is a modern picture of Izmir, Smyrna. It's a beautiful oh. city. Uh, and let me show you. It's got a great museum there. It's got a, it's got a great museum here. You remember in Ephesus? Guys over here on my left, I apologize. I'll try to turn it over here so you can at least see a little bit of it. Remember in Ephesus, you had the emperor's temple. This is the temple of Artemis. We talked about it last week. And then you also had the first emperor's temple where people came and worshipped the emperor, the government. Uh, the emperor was God. The Roman emperor was God of the world. Uh, Caesar is Lord, is how you acknowledge that. So Christians refused to do that. They, what they did was, they said, no, Jesus is Lord. And so they would draw the fish. Remember, I showed you last week, in Greek, the word fish means ichthus. Ichthus is an acrostic. Iesu Christu Theo Weos Soter. That means Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. So, because they were being put to death for refusing to say Caesar is Lord, they would identify one another by drawing a fish. And, and this is from way back. We've already spoken of Smyrna being in persecution, the Christians there. The synagogue was an actual synagogue of Jews in the city of Smyrna. But as Howard read, they were not... ...of kindness and they walked humbly with God, Micah 6, 8. They were religious Jews who were actually persecuting Christians. A man is not a Jew, Howard said, quoting Romans 2, because he's one outwardly. A man is a Jew because he's been circumcised by the power of God. Now, as I mentioned to you, let me give you five examples where this phrase, synagogue of Satan, is used throughout history. The Dead Sea Scrolls. When John the Baptist uh, served as an Essene, Many people believe John the Baptist was the high priest of a replicated temple out in the desert. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, and Doc here is a scholar of the Dead Sea oh, Scrolls. No, no. Well, you are. He's oh, humble. No. Very seldom is he humble, but he's humble this morning. So uh, <laughs> He's a scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, recently found this phrase, synagogue of Satan was found referencing the temple in Jerusalem. Unbelievable. Yeah. Second, let I me, think I shared... About the, huh? Go ahead. He's a student of the Dead Sea Scrolls. I translated the, the uh, commentary on Habakkuk. Hmm. Well, I was one of the first that translated that and read it. A guy from Duke, it's different letters, and he put it in the Hebrew letters I could read. Anyway, part of my dissertation... Man, that's a huge library, the Dead Sea Scrolls. No one has read all of them. It's a... It's a huge library. It's a huge library, yeah. and we're just now, it's coming where you can really get it, photostatic yeah. <coughs> copies of it. Yeah. I knew a lot of the guys that first yeah. worked over there, but yeah. that's, they didn't do much. <laughs> one of them got drunk, and one of the scholars, named John Strugnell, you can read on the Internet, he drank beer all the time, and he was the head of the Dead Sea Scrolls study. And he got drunk, and the, the reporters caught him and said, what do you think of the, the Jewish religion? He said, that's a decadent religion. They ought to all join the Roman Catholic Church. And they, uh, well, and they, and they put fired him, And they put him in the newspaper right? and fired his butt the next day. Yeah. He was done. Yeah, he was done. 
that was my buddy that I knew all about the Dead Sea Scrolls. See, he is an expert on the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> Tim, go ahead. You know, we tend to think that the Jews all believed the same thing, but this is where in this time period there was a, all these different sects of Judaism. The yep. Essenes were one of those yep. sects. The Essenes had <laughs> left out... <laughs> had left Jerusalem and gone yep. out to make their own community because they didn't think that, you know, they had sold out to the Romans that the Sadducees had. So you had the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Herodians, yep. all of these different sects. And yep. they were out there by themselves yep. because they weren't yep. strict enough. Correct. They thought Tim's, Tim's right. right. The temple in Jerusalem was the synagogue of Satan. By the way, 5th century A.D., a guy by the name of Dioscorus from Alexandria, a Roman Catholic bishop. He was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church in the Council of Chalcedon because he believed in monophysitism, which in Greek means Jesus only has one nature, divine or a mixture of the divine and human, but not two natures, which is what the Council of Chalcedon declared. So in his diary, he called the Council of Chalcedon a synagogue of Satan. These are the two ladies who call Cambridge a synagogue of Satan. Billy Graham, I mentioned, in the White House with his conversation uh, with Nixon. And then the Pope, Pope Pius, called Freemasonry a synagogue of Satan. Here's the thing I'm trying to impress upon you. To know a proper definition of a synagogue of Satan, you've got to take it from the text, not people's opinions, from the text. And in the text, it's a synagogue, like Ryan said, of Jews who worship in Smyrna. But now watch. What I'm about to show you is pretty darn incredible in my opinion. They turned the Christians in for being traitors to the Roman government. Now, I want to read to you Pergamum. I'll read it again. It comes right after Smyrna. We'll come back to Smyrna, so we're not quite done. But listen to this about the city of Pergamum. I'm going to read it to you. We've talked about the tribulation, the poverty, the stress, the ten days Tim mentioned. Uh, death, be faithful as you're persecuted. He said to the Christians in Smyrna, if you have an ear to hear what I'm saying, you who overcome, you will not be hurt by the second death. We're going to come back to the second death. To me, the second death is a huge doctrine of Christianity. We'll talk about it in just a second. But now let's go to Pergamum, which is the city just north of Smyrna, the third of seven. Let me read it. And to the messenger of the church in Pergamum, write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. Who is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword? Who is it? It's Jesus. Where's the sword coming out of? His mouth. What is the sword? His word. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So here's what this text, verse 12, is saying. Listen to the word of Christ. Verse 13. This is to Pergamum. I know where you dwell, you Christians, you followers of mine. I know where you dwell. Look at this next phrase. Where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you. Look at this next phrase. Where Satan dwells. In Greek, Satana. Okay, i got to ask you a question. Where does Satan dwell? In the world. There you go. However, you're right. However, the ancients believed that the dwelling of the gods was in the place of their throne. So they would build temples with a throne and say, this god dwells here. Let me show you something about Pergamum. Revelation 2, Satan dwells in Pergamum. His throne is there. Uh, Tim, one of the reasons why I take the scriptures literally is because of historical context. In Pergamum, this is what's called the Temple of Zeus Soter. 
Now, now hang in there with me because I'm going to show you this building exists today. It was excavated and taken to a museum in Berlin. The temple of Zeus Soter. Zeus was the chief god, the god of government and the world. Soter means savior. This is where people would come from all over the world to give their allegiance to the government of Rome. It was excavated in the 1870s. This is it right here. They dug it up. And guess what they did? They took it to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin. Berlin. You can actually go see it. They whitewashed it. <coughs> you can go see it. Now let me tell you how people worshipped in Pergamum. During the days of the disciples of Christ when John writes, here's how people worshipped. They would come to this place right here. They would kneel down and say, Caesar is Savior and Lord. And say, Zeus, thank you for Rome. They worship government. Christians refused. They refused to do that. So they were often put to death. Pergamum is where Satan dwelled in terms, Mark, of his throne. That's what the text says. Now, after you worshipped Zeus Soter, here, you know what you did next? You walked next door. And you entered into the healing center. Where if you had any kind of sickness, you would walk in and sleep the night among non-poisonous snakes. If you've ever wondered why the Escopolis the medical pole has a snake on top. This is where it comes from. You would go in and you would sleep and you would pray to the God of government for your healing. Okay? Now, here's what's interesting. And then we'll come back to the text. Those who believe government is God find their roots in Pergamum. Where the throne of Satan is. Anybody know what this is? It's the Kremlin. Anybody know whose tomb this is? It's Lenin's tomb. Do you know what this is a model of? Pergamum. Zeus Soter. Listen to me. In our day, when young people have zero clue about the dangers of trusting government, if you know history, you understand that even in the beginning of the building of the kingdom, Jesus Christ, with the word coming out of His mouth, says to His followers, Do not trust government. Do not trust where Satan's throne resides. Do not trust Okay, now I'm going to step on some toes. President Trump. President Biden. Can I get an amen? amen. amen. Well, a lot more amens on that one than uh, the other one. Don't trust government. Now, watch. People will say to me, Bill, why in the world are you such a defender of Israel? It's not because I think they're government is marvelous. No, no, no. They're the only democracy among Islamic republics that would <clears throat> rather kill whites and Christians and Jews than sit down and eat with them. But we need to be careful. And Tim, I'll close with this. I love the way you teach because you tell people, trust the kingdom. Focus on the kingdom. It is Jesus Christ. Having said that, we still live in a world where governments go to war. And the question is, how are we going to now live? I'm going to love my Muslim friends. I'm going to love my transgender friends. I'm going to love my homosexual friends. I'm going to eat dinner with them. I'm going to tell them the truth. I'm going to love them like Christ loves me. But when it comes to government, I'm going to tell everyone, don't. Put your trust in government. 
I think that's the lesson of Smyrna and Pergamum. Let's talk about it. What does the colonel say about that? Colonel! Colonel! What do you say about that, my friend? You're retired, so it's okay. Yeah, you won't. No recording, Just the one going out live around the world. <laughs> Nothing to say? Let me ask you this, Andy. I mean, you're a fighter pilot. We're a fighter pilot. Um, and you had the only plane in Africa that could rescue Americans in times of crisis. In fact, when we had some trouble in, in uh, Niger, I mean, to be able to call uh, somebody like Andy, the defense attache, and rescue Americans is, is, is uh, pretty remarkable. Andy, did you ever struggle dropping a bomb on the enemy as a follower of Jesus Christ? No. Uh, I flew the F-15, so we didn't have bombs, but we were, you know, had missiles and uh, was in Iraq, uh, in uh, the Middle East four different times. But, uh, no, you know, okay. just a uh, defender of the Constitution. Yep. And doing what, uh, yep. <coughs> so no. He did not. Okay, now watch this. Guys, Guys, watch this. In my opinion, the only way a follower of Jesus can be a fighter pilot is to separate his kingdom identity from his national identity. But listen to me carefully. The national law is the laws of nature. What is that? Micah 6.8. These are the laws of nature. Micah 6.8. Love justice. Be kind. Walk humbly. By the way, justice is both restorative justice and retributive justice, meaning you punish. That's justice. By the definition of justice in our modern day, it's lost the, re, re, uh, the retribution sense of it. Okay, now, there are some followers of Jesus that can't separate the kingdom from their nation. I respect the heck out of them. Can somebody tell me who these Christians are? Give me names. Amish. Give me other names. Quakers. Very good. Give me other names. Mennonites. Not, not all Mennonites, but probably the majority of Mennonites. They are conscientious objectors. Anybody see that movie of uh, the guy that won the Medal of Honor going up the cliff? Yeah, it's an awesome movie. What's the name of it? Hacksaw Ridge. If you have never seen Hacksaw Ridge, go rent it tonight. Watch it this week. It is a true story. It is a follower of Jesus who was a conscientious objector, would not carry a weapon, and up and down, up and down, up and down, Hacksaw Ridge. He rescues, I don't know, dozens of soldiers and brings a, is given the Medal of Honor. My heart was stirred. Let me show you something here. I'm not that guy. I'm just not. That's not the way I'm bent. I would carry a gun in order to correct an injustice. And I'm going to switch to Israel right here. Let me tell you something. If my daughter was attacked by Islamist jihadists, Hamas, did y'all see 60 Minutes, the general for Israel who grabbed his gun and went down to rescue his family? Yep. Killed terrorists? Okay, let me, I don't know. Don't judge me here, Doc. Don't judge me. But if my daughter were in a kibbutz and she called and said, Daddy, they're coming in. Listen, I love Jesus, but I would grab every gun I had, every bullet I had, and I would go kill the terrorists. Okay, but now here's the deal. Here's the deal. Some Christians disagree with that. And I respect them for that. I respect them. But I separate, Tim, my national identity from my kingdom identity. And I can do that. But some Christians can't. <coughs> Discussion. What do you think, Mr. Mike Harris? I'm shooting them all. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I have no problem with that. You don't? No. 
But but let me ask you, you wouldn't have a problem with a Christian who said, because of my kingdom principles, I can't. You know, it, it's just like transgender and all this other stuff. Yeah. It's what they, their heart is. That's okay. what they are. Uh, that's not who I am. I'm with you. Uh, you know, if, if they don't feel comfortable, yeah. you know, defending yeah. what yeah. they believe, yeah. or they're, yeah, right. they're defending what they believe. Yeah. Um, what I believe is. Yeah. I'm you know, with you, Mike. So you see it. Howard. God makes a distinction. David is slain his thousands, or Saul is slain his thousands, David is ten thousands, and God is saying, go, go, go. But then he kills one man remotely, Uriah, for his own purposes, in, instead of as an instrument of God, as part of the military. God says, no, no, no. So God makes a big distinction. You know, again, we see that in New Testament, Romans 13. The government does not will the sword in vain. So God has instituted government way back coming out of Noah, yeah. and there's a plan to have some semblance of law and order versus everybody running roughshod before Noah, yeah. and the thoughts of the men to charge is evil continuously. Yeah. So it's one thing to be doing something in the line of duty in accordance with principles of law and order and yeah. civil judgment, as another to take personal revenge yeah. and murder. And you know, God is very. That's what I read as He says about. You know, don't take your own revenge yep. individually. Yeah. Good, Howard. Let me do this, Tim. And I want you to come back at me here for just a little bit. In 2020, my heart began to change. I've always preached the kingdom. It's always, it's always been about Christ. It's always been about grace. I mean, it, it, it just has. I began to see in 2020 people trusting the government. I began to see Pergamum. I began to see people saying... Here, save us. Save us. Save us with your money. Save us, oh government. Save us. And I'm telling you, Doc, and, and I, the second thing that happened was this man right here. Uh, Tim, he began to convince me that the Hebrew Scriptures, Amos 9, 7, Are you not, O children of Israel, the same to me as the Ethiopians? I called them from Cush to their land. I called the Philistines from Kaftor. I called the Syrians from Kerr. I have as much of a role in those nations as I do you, O Israel. And so, Tim, I'm with you that there is no special nation right now in God's eyes. We're all alike. And that's where we agree, but the dispensationalists disagree with us. They say Israel is God's covenant nation. We say, no, all the nations are gods. And I began, I began to feel a burden to call people out from their trust of the government. This is why Pergamum means so much to me. Why Smyrna, the Christians there who were persecuted, they were in the middle of tribulation. And by the way, tribulation is coming to you and to me. Because when you speak the truth, the government's coming against you. Matt. We just look at things as place or as a people. We're just talking about the heart. And is it a place or is it a people? Is Israel the place that we always do? And I know it's beautiful and it's, we just study where God's coming back. But. Are we talking about the change of the heart? Yeah, it's a people. Tim, what would you people or place? yeah? Would you say God's who are God's people? Is it a place or is it a people? Well, it's a people. I mean, it's people who are must followers of Messiah. Yeah? Right. Yeah. It's, 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 and those who are not are not. I mean, what, I could chime in with what Howard said in Romans two twenty eight with Philippians, where he calls the Jews mutilators. Mutilators. And, uh, in Galatians chapter 3, where Abraham's seeds are by those who have come by faith. It has nothing to do with whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. Very good. Uh, and, uh, they said, yep. the synagogue of Satan, it, 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 it's all the Correct. It's the people. Correct. I think when Jeff responded to a posting that you made about the the attack on Israel. Yeah. 
what it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I took it, he is saying that the Jews are are claiming to be the chosen. They are not actually the real Jews of the Old Testament. Yeah, Jeff, what he's talking about is, I made a post about war in Israel. Jeff, Jeff Rogers, Rogers, a friend of ours, came in, and, and Mark is saying, and he commented, Mark is saying he's saying that the Jews are not real Jews. I think what Jeff is saying, he's correcting Christians. And by the way, I agree with Jeff. I don't think the Jews are God's chosen people today. God's chosen people are those who have been cut in the heart. Then people say, well, wait, why are you such a strong defender of Israel if they're not God's chosen people? Because they're the only ones that can stop Islamic radical terrorism in the Middle East. That's it. That's the only reason. Well, then, uh, why would, I mean, for me and my, and my life work, I defend the guilty and the innocent from someone wanting to harm them. That's good. And that's, a, that's all that they're doing. They're defending themselves. <coughs> Where would we not stand up and defend those, I mean, the people that are coming Agreed. across in Iran? We stand behind those. Agreed. The people uh, that were in Vietnam, we stood. Yeah. We stand behind those people. Yeah. We stand behind the people, yes. not the government. But yes. on the same hand, I mean, in the, yeah. in the same breath, what government was not yeah. put in place by God? Correct. None. Right. Absolutely none. Right. Well, maybe maybe it's all all powers are ordained by. Radical, then God brings them down. Yes. Yeah, no. Doc's convinced me that. We're going to come to Doc, to Tim, and we'll finish up. One quick thing. Here's, I, I want to challenge you guys. People are coming against Israel now. They're coming against Israel. Guys, ask yourself the question. Would Hamas terrorists have dropped leaflets on the kibbutz saying, in seven days we're coming? No. Why are people not thinking about that? Why okay. Not leaving is the question. But I guess philosophically, real quick, back to the, the question on the, the, the Jewish thing. So whenever in the Old Testament, if you were not from the, the Israel, any of the Israel tribes, you could have a purification ritual to become a Jew. And so Christ is the completion of that Jewish purification ritual. And so if you are not purified by Christ, you are not in the completion of the Jewish purification ritual, which means that you're not really a Jew. Right. Because, because it's, it's a matter, matter of the heart. heart. <coughs> the sword is coming out of his mouth is a word. But that sword also becomes a literal sword that kills people. And you get to chapter 19, it's very, very clear about that. Wow. And I think, yes, we preach the gospel the word of God, but we also use force to, de to defend people that are being attacked or ourselves. That's a clear definition of a two-sided sword. But bingo. Yeah. Well, what is your insignia of the special forces about? What is it? Tell us. You're talking about uh, one in terms of how the operational concept of special forces is dealt in side of skill. But also at the same time, the two-sided sword is to go in there and prepare those that are being oppressed, those that are being challenged and being threatened and having their lives taken away from them by an oppressor, like terrorists. Mm -hmm. The other side of that special forces concept is to nurture them, to develop them, to educate them, to, 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 to feed them. And That's good, Jim. Forward. That's good. By the way, Doc, this, this is, is really, really scary. scary. Because, because the more I read what you write and the more I hear you talk, the more I agree with you, well, I'm, I'm well, getting you know, very you concerned. You can, you can, Jenny. Yeah. So let's go here. We've got two more comments and we'll be done. John. Just like your article on content. Yes, sir. The only people that can be content with where they are are the ones that have Jesus Christ in their life. Amen. 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 And by the way, what, thank you, John. John, what Doc said, Ronnie, you have something? Okay, we'll let you close us out. What Doc said is something that he's strong on. And he's the Hebrew and Greek scholar. Listen to me. 
Christ holds the keys of life and death. And death in this world is not outside of the purview of a sovereign God. That's all part of His plan. But the second death does not harm those who know Christ. What is the second death? We'll pick that up next week. Ronnie. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the vision of the soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Very good, Ronnie. All right, I'm going to dismiss us. Those of you watching online, thank you for uh, being a part of this discussion. Next week, we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 2, uh, beginning with verse 18. And let me just show you. At, there we go. Let me just show you on the map so that you'll see. And we'll go with this. And it's good to have everybody here today. We, we have we've done Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum. We're going to do Thyatira and Sardis. And then we'll close with Philadelphia and Laodicea. These are the seven churches. Just remember, if your wife or spouse or child says, what did you learn today? <laughs> Wayne? <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Sue? Ask Wayne. What did you learn today? Here you go. In Smyrna, the Christians were going through tribulation. Persecution. Tribulation is cyclical. Revelation occurs over and over and over again. And we might be in the middle of another cycle. Pergamum was the place where the throne of Satan was, which is the model for Lenin's tomb. It's an illustration of trust in government rather than God. By the way, Antipas, I didn't tell you this, Antipas was a physician who told followers of Jesus, don't go to the Escopolis. You don't need to be among snakes. Jesus is Savior. He will save you. Pray to Him. They ask Him to renounce His faith in Christ and to profess His faith at Zeus Soter. Antipas refused. And they put Him to death in front of the entire city. That's in history. That's the Antipas of Revelation 2. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you, sir.